Good evening, everybody. Thank you all for joining us on this uh, rainy evening, but we're very happy to have you. Uh, existing members and new attendees, welcome all. My name is George, I'm the Programs Manager here at the History Center. We're very happy to have you. We've got a very exciting presentation tonight. We're happy to have uh, the guest curator of the Art of the Miniature exhibit here with us, Madeline Crispell. So Madeline's going to be giving us an introduction into the history of the miniature field in the Chicago region. And after a presentation with Madeline, we're going to be breaking up into about two groups just to accommodate uh, the space available in the exhibit there. And Madeline's going to be giving us a curatorial tour of the new Art of the Miniature exhibit, which is very generously sponsored by Anne Lyon and the Hunter Family Foundation. So thank you to both of those parties for allowing us to make that exhibit possible. So uh, the presentation, as I said, will last about 20 to 25 minutes. We'll have 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end of that. And then uh, we will break up. And so one group will go with Madeline for the first door, and then we'll swap, and then the second group will go with her. So don't want to waste any more time. I'm just going to go right into our introduction. Madeline Crispell is a curator and historian whose work focuses on material culture and decorative arts. She is the curator for the University Guild at Northwestern University, the exhibit curator for the Historic Pullman Foundation, and is the guest curator of the Art of the Miniature exhibit here at the History Center, available until March 2023. So with that, I would like to turn the stage over to Madeline Crispell. Thank you very much, George. Thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight on Tuesday. Thank you to Lori and Carol for all of your help. Obviously, we couldn't have done the exhibit without every member of the team. So what we're going to do today is walk you through uh, Narcissa Nyblak Horn's life, how that relates to her art creating miniatures, and then we're going to do a little bit of an overview of some other notable miniature makers who have a connection to the Chicago area. Narcissa Nyblak was born in Vincennes, Indiana in 1882 to a prosperous family. She moved to Hyde Park with her family at the age of eight when her father took a job in Chicago with the Chicago Title and Trust Company. She went to a finishing school and would later as an adult um, recall about her childhood. The trouble with my childhood was that I was given no education. Knowing how to put my hat on straight was supposed to be enough. Now, Narcissa Nightlack was an incredibly curious person, and even though she wasn't given an education in the types of things that she would later call on to make her miniature room, she certainly sought that education out for herself. Her family traveled extensively in her youth, which is the root of her interest in historic European art and design, and her uncle, who was a rear admiral in the Navy, sparked her early interest in miniatures, where any time that he would travel somewhere in the world, he would buy antique miniatures in that place and send them back to Narcissa Thorne in Indiana and later Chicago. In 1901, Narcissa Thorne married James Ward Thorne. He was uh, one of the heirs to the Montgomery Ward fortune and uh, her childhood sweetheart. They married when she was 19 and eventually moved here to Lake Forest where they lived in a house on 600 Ridge Road. And I'll mention the architect of that later. About 25 years after their marriage, James Ward Thorne retired. And in 1926, he and Narcissa Nightlack Thorne embarked on what would become a turning point trip for them to Europe. Because it was in Europe on this trip that she first saw Queen Mary's dollhouse. Now, dollhouses have a long and rich history in Europe, which I'm not going to get to too much in this presentation because I'll be talking about it on my tour. But this example from the 1920s is particularly rich and was incredibly influential to Narcissa Thorne. Queen Mary, uh, the great grandmother, the grandmother of Queen Elizabeth, uh, had this house um, created for her as a gift from the nation. It's one of the most elaborate dollhouses and was meant to be an exhibition uh, item in the 1926 
26, or 26, Empire Exhibition in London. It became a showcase for British manufacturing, and so many different designers and craftsmen and manufacturers who already worked with the British royal family did their work again in miniature for inclusion in the dollhouse. And so there's real food and real soap. It has working electricity and running hot and cold water. Uh, what you can see, a little sliver of there, the cellar, the wine cellar in the basement, all of the bottles were real and filled with their real corresponding spirits. There's a miniature library where all of the books really open and you can read them. And the royal family commissioned new works to be created that would fit in a book that big by authors like Arthur Conan Doyle. And something like this was incredibly influential to Narcissa Thorne because it's happening at the same time as another major trend in America, that of the period. In the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, old houses in Europe were beginning to be sold to people in America. And so paneling, carving, stonework, all of these things that had previously seemed immovable are being moved wholesale from their original castles and country homes in Europe to be included at places like the Metropolitan Museum. Now, these period rooms become incredibly popular. The earliest are seen at World's Fairs, and then they become a standard in museums. I'm sure you've noticed that the Art Institute does not have period rooms. I'll come to this later, but that's what the Thorne miniature rooms became for us, is Chicago's version of those period rooms to learn about decorative arts history. So between the period rooms in American museums, Queen Mary's incredibly elaborate, detailed, and rich dollhouse, and then also the travels that Narcissa and, Nate and James were doing to historic and architecturally important homes, and also to the sorts of uh, antique stores in Paris and London where she could source antique miniatures that she would later use in her rooms. Between all of these different things, she decided in the 1920s to begin her miniature room project. This is a photo of Narcissa Thorne in her studio. She had many different iterations of her studio. The first was started in 1930, when it became clear that the number of miniatures that she had acquired during her time in Europe would necessitate a larger space than the apartment that she and her husband had on Lakeshore Drive. She rented a studio on Oak Street on the Gold Coast in Chicago and began to hire different people who would help her uh, realize her vision. 1930, I mentioned, is when she's beginning this project, and so she's able to help employ people who were out of work because of the Great Depression. People, architects, designers, craftsmen, who ordinarily would have never been working in a miniature scale, are uh, given work by Narcissa, you know, partly because they're out of work otherwise, and partly specifically because one of the early goals of her decorative arts miniature rooms is to help inspire people who were decorating their homes in the 1930s with historic examples of design. And so the idea is, if you know, you're using Edwin Clark, which was the architect of her home here in Lake Forest, he also designed the library at her apartment in Chicago, he designed the first 12 of her four miniature rooms, doing it exactly the way that he would have drafted an actual scale home, but of course everything is 112 scale, so a foot is an inch. Now, he's the same architect who built the Brookfield Zoo, so it's certain that if it was one decade before or earlier that she embarked on this project, that's the sort of person that she wouldn't have been able to use. Now, she also uh, sourced many of the designers and craftsmen who worked on her rooms, which, again, I won't get into too, too much detail with since we covered that in the exhibition, from Marshall Field. I mentioned her husband's connection to Montgomery Ward. She and her husband were very close friends of the Fields family. 
and so on Marshall Fields, drew back some of the design work that they were doing in their window department and the design inside the store. She hired out many of the artists and craftsmen who did work for Marshall Fields, who themselves were often carvers and, uh, you know, very skilled craftsmen from Europe. In 1933, the first public exhibition, the Four Miniature Rooms, opened in the Chicago Century of Progress, which is the, the second Chicago World's Fair. First in 1893, the second in 1933. It was an incredibly popular exhibition. These first 12 rooms that she exhibited were all European, primarily French in the 18th century. And then when the fair was continued for an additional year in 1934, she and her studio made another 14 rooms to help augment the exhibition. Most of these still European, but for the first time she built a couple of her American rooms. They were hugely popular, the World's Fair. Uh, 300,000 people specifically went to see the miniature rooms. And this set of 26 early rooms uh, stayed traveling and exhibiting for the next 10 years. Um, they were exhibited at the San Francisco's World Fair in 1938 and New York's World Fair in 1940. In 1942, the Art Institute sold them to IBM, who uh, exhibited them and toured them for 20 years before selling them. Um, one of her sons, uh, Nyblack, who was living in Phoenix, purchased a portion of those rooms. You can see them today at the Phoenix Art Museum. The rest of that early set is in Knoxville, where IBM went them. However, part of the process of building these early rooms led to Narcissa reflecting on how to better tell the history of decorative arts as she wanted to in a permanent way. And so, in the late 1930s and early 1940s, she began building the 68 rooms that today make up the Art Institute's foreign miniature room collection. And you can see two catalogs from uh, both the European and the American rooms from the early 1960s here, included mainly because I love their covers. <laughs> now, these rooms were all created after that first set created for the Chicago World's Fair, and they can be seen as a refined version of her previous method of creating the rooms. Her studio was more established, and at any given time, there would have been several rooms in creation, either at the stage of the case, the molding, or putting the furniture in to finish it. She conceptualized and designed all of the rooms to be educational in two ways. The first is the more obvious one, the historical way, where today if you go to your institute or if you buy a catalog of the foreign miniature rooms, what you'll learn is about the history of decorative arts and what decorative arts looked like in 18th century France versus in 19th century England. That was always of concern to her, but she was also very interested in educating in good taste, having the rooms be aesthetically informative as well. And so while today people will comment on how they're not exactly accurate for each period, neither are the full-sized period rooms that you can see in museums either. We're always translating the tastes of yesteryear through the tastes of today. And Narcissa Thorne is very attracted to symmetry and elegant lines, and that comes through both in her choice of rooms, which heavily favor 18th century France, and also in um, how she edited the rooms that she chose. Many of them will have a real life example that she drew on, but she'll make certain edits to swap out a molding that she thinks is a better example or to make things look more symmetrical. The example that you can see here is one of my favorite of the four miniature rooms and one of the most unusual as an example of a room in California in 1940. This is one of the best examples of a room that has no real life equivalent. She felt that it was important to make a room that uh, referenced modernism and new modern design, 
although in her words, she didn't care much for plastic chairs. And so it's sort of the most luxurious and elegant version of that 1940s modern design. Uh, one of the things that I particularly appreciate about this example is that all of the art that's featured in the room was painted by real artists. And the painting that you see right above the right sofa is by Fernand Leger, the famous Cubist French artist. So even though it was not to her taste, she still made a very nice modern room. Now, the foreign rooms, which you can still see today at the Art Institute, of course, are only one of the examples of famous miniatures that uh, still can be seen in Chicago or were created by Chicago miniature makers. Another well-known example is Colleen Moore's Fairy Castle, which you can see today at the Museum of Science and Industry. Colleen Moore began work on her fantastical miniature fairy castle in 1928. And as an interesting inverse of how Narcissa Thorne, because of her connections to the world of department stores, employed so many people with ties to Marshall Fields, Colleen Moore, in the creation of her house, employed many people who had ties to set design and to movie making. The main um, designer and craftsman who she worked with was Harold Grieve, who was an art director in Hollywood and also an interior designer. Colleen Moore and Narcissa Thorne knew each other and became friendly over the course of both of them making their miniature projects. And in fact, in the Middletown room, which is one of the only miniature rooms set in the Midwest, it's an Indiana room based on the town that Narcissa Thorne grew up in, you can see a miniature steam locomotive toy that was a gift to her from Colleen Moore for her house. Um, although you can't say that Colleen Moore's fairy castle is meant to be educational in any way, both she and Narcissa Thorne had charitable causes very close to their hearts. And over the course of the Great Depression, the fairy castle was toured across the country to raise money for children's charities until eventually Colleen Moore donated it to the Museum of Science and Industry, where you can see it today. Another miniature maker in the Chicago area is uh, Francis Lesnar Lee. A very different sort of miniature room here. Um, Frances Lester Lee is also from the Chicago area and was actually a girlhood friend of Narcissa Thorne. Just so happened that both women would eventually make miniatures later in life. Um, if Colleen Moore's Fairy Castle shares the passion for design and charitable causes, the uh, nutshell studies of unexplained deaths, which is what this kitchen, as you can see, is one of the series of, uh, shares the spirit of education that's at the heart of the Thorne Miniature Rooms. Frances Lester's nutshell studies of unexplained death uh, were part of her early effort to teach forensic science. She's the first female police captain in the United States and considered the mother of forensic science and created miniature versions of crime scenes where blood splatter and bullet holes, everything was exactly correct in order to teach investigators how to use forensic science to glean everything you need to know from a crime scene. Now, I'm going to end with a quotation that Dr. Hans Huth the Art Institute's Curator of Decorative Arts wrote in 1959 on the occasion of Mrs. Thorne being made an honorary curator at the Art Institute. I think too many people now take Mrs. Thorne's rooms for granted and accept them as something any wealthy lady could have done. But that shows a lack of understanding as Mrs. Thorne conceived something for which there was no precedent. True, there have been doll's houses, and I know some magnificent ones dating far back, but Mrs. Thorne's creation is something entirely different. Her idea was not to make up some kind of doll rooms to amuse the public as all the others I know. Instead, she visualized the manner of life in the past and did so as precisely she knew how. All this might have been done to the point, but altogether boring. 
The fact that this did not happen, but that the rooms are admired by young and old, as well as by professionals, is due to the fact that they are done full of taste, imagination, and one might say in a dramatic fashion. Many of them look as if the actor has just left the stage and that now it will be the task of the visitor to imagine what has just happened or indeed might happen next. Thank you. Yes. I'm just curious, if these rooms are toured, packed up and moved, how in the world would we keep them from being That's damaged? That's a great question. So there was one particular woman who Narcissa Horn hired, whose name now I do not remember, Leticia something, who um, traveled with the rooms when they would travel from World's Fair to World's Fair. There was a map of where every piece of furniture and everything goes in the rooms because she didn't move them down. And then she herself sometimes would also go to make sure they had been installed correctly. But for those first 26 rooms, it would take about three weeks to completely install them in a new place. But the answer to your question really is just painstaking attention and too much time, I think. You referenced her looking, shopping for miniature items in France and England. Was this a, a, a rate, was this something popular that people were doing, that there was actually people manufacturing miniaturized things? So there was. Um, what she was looking for, though, were antique items. So the first wave of popularity of dollhouses, or what those early ones are called, baby houses, not because they're for babies, because they're baby size. Those become really popular in the 1600s in Northern Europe, particularly in the Netherlands, in England, in Germany. And the people who owned those incredibly elaborate early dollhouses, which when fully furnished would have rivaled a full-sized home and how expensive they were, the people who owned those after World War I are beginning to sell them, maybe in new circumstances. And so many people who were collecting many things go to Europe in the 1920s to, for good and bad reasons, take advantage of some of that upheaval. And so this wave of vintage antique miniatures that hadn't been accessible before are now being able to be purchased. And so that's what ends up in many of the European miniature rooms, for example, where in one of the 18th century drawing rooms, you can see at the Art Institute, there's a real 18th century desk that unlocks and opens. So many things were purpose built for the rooms, but she was also purchasing some brand new things. For example, she bought a little glass marble globe that so impressed Queen Mary that she had to mail one to England for her. But she was also buying a lot of antiques. Uh, did she, a couple of questions. Did, did the studio accept private commissions? So that's a great question. It 
She did one commission in her entire career, and it's hard to even call it a commission since she did not accept payment, and that was for the royal family. Um, Queen Mary, as I mentioned, who had that beautiful, elaborate dollhouse that today you can see at Windsor Castle, she asked Narcissa Thorne to uh, recreate the Windsor Library in miniature, which she did for the royal family. It was meant to be a gift for the coronation of the new king, Edward the Eighth, Edward the Seventh, the one who abdicated. Moral of the story, he did not get coronated, and then that just became a gift to the royal family. I believe today it's in the collection of the Victoria and Albert, but you can see it at Windsor Castle. But that's the only commission. So, is there a registry of the realms? Now, the reason I ask is that a few years ago. There was a garden tour here in Lake Forest, and we had the great opportunity of going in Mrs. Jamie Fields' home, and she had several thorn rooms in her library. And I was wondering, do we know? Oh, how yes, many so these she rooms made are in Lake Forest. So, of that early set that she made for the uh, World's Fair, all of those are accounted for. Then the next set, those were made for the Art Institute, those are all there. In the years after, from the early 1940s until her death in 1966, she made many more shadow boxes, miniature rooms, and sometimes entire dollhouses. Because she was so involved in different charities, she would make them to auction off for those charities. So what you'll be able to see in the exhibition when we're done is some of the examples of rooms like that. So I couldn't give you a number of how many four miniature rooms are out there. The answer is, you know, more than you think, I think. <laughs> uh, last, we probably will cover this on the floor, but when we were looking at the rooms just a little while ago, we were wondering how the, how the um, decorations that appear to be metal yeah. at chandeliers were made. So, you know, one of the things that I always recommend to people, metal is actually one of the easier things to make in a miniature room. Just think about jewelry. The way that you have rings that are very detailed with tiny little metal pieces, that's exactly how they're making the miniature metal pieces that appear in the rooms. Eugene Kupchak, who's uh, one of the later era of very famous miniature makers and who started in her studio, his father was a watchmaker and he used jeweler's tools in order to make those little metal objects. But Oftentimes, things that appear like they're made of wood or other materials are actually made of metal because metal is so much easier to cast and to work with. So the studio would have had experts, like yeah. a jeweler, making a clock or whatever. Right. She had different people who were suited, you know, someone who was really good at needlework, someone who was really good at wood carving, someone who could do molding. It's very similar to what you would expect in a full-sized architect's studio, for example. Did they work in one place, or did they work from home? They worked in the studio. I'm sure they were able to make little things at home and bring them in, but the, the big group was there. Great presentation. I'm enjoying this very much. And what part did she actually contribute? Did she have the crafts of making the textiles and the, you know, probably the wallpaper and everything? What part did she do? So she is the, I think of her as the director of the rooms. So the way the director of the movie will say, I want it to look like this and feel like that, and that's not quite right. She's the one who picks the furniture, where's the furniture going to go. She determines what the rooms will look like, the colors of everything. For the historic rooms, she picks areas that she wants to represent in history. So she would, at times, contribute to making some of the things, particularly textile. But really, she's the producer, the director. I think of her very much as a designer. She's designing the experience. Any more questions? Could she have done this without photography? So she's going to Europe to see these rooms. She has to reproduce. She's using photography, yeah. So, um, not color photography. No, not color photography, but 
she would make very detailed notes of what color she wants. And also, you know, for most of the rooms that she's recreating, she's not recreating them. She's using them as a point of entry and departure. So, you know, it's not super important to her that the colors of the tapestry are the exact colors of the tapestry. She'll edit them to be more to her aesthetic taste, which is also what was happening, I want to be clear, in full-size period rooms. Those are equally not an accurate version of what it looks like to 7th to 18th century France. I'm curious if you know at all what her own home looks like, and did she ever make models for her own home? Yes, so she had a cabinet of curios where she kept some of her favorite miniature items, but most of the, her miniatures either were auctioned off for charity or went to the Art Institute. So she didn't have a ton of miniatures on display. Um, her home is very similar, her homes, I should say, since she moved, um, are very similar to the aesthetic of the floor miniature room. She's very interested in 18th century French and English design and those clean, thin lines of that period uh, were very interesting to her just for her own interior design, which is how she hoped other people would see the rooms too, as a point of inspiration. Can you tell us about the Woman's Exchange and her association with it? Sure. So thank you for that question, because you will see a trophy from the Women's Exchange in the um, exhibition. She was very involved in a number of different charities in the Chicago area, but particularly ones that were led and run by women. The Women's Exchange is one of the ones that she was most closely associated with. And um, she auctioned off many of those rooms that she made later in life for the Women's Exchange. Her studio for much of that later period in the 40s, 50s, and 60s was in the 900 North building before it is the 900 North building today, the one that was there previously, in the Women's Exchange offices. So she had a very close working relationship with them. It's, it's, uh, I'm trying to think of a good other similar charity that would be an example for it today, but it, it's a, a women's charity, you know, when women together giving back. And so a women's exchange store is like a junior league or something where you would, you could go buy antiques and clothes and things like that. Um, all right, I think time for tour. Thank you so much, Natalie. So I'll just say a couple words before we get into the tour here. I think we're probably going to do maybe a dozen people per group. So we'll do two groups, maybe a dozen people each, just so that no one's really packed up tight uh, back in the exhibit there. Um, but I did want to say uh, a special thank you to Madeline for making it back out again and for giving us such a wonderful uh, introduction to the history of the miniature field. Uh, a couple of things I wanted to mention before we adjourn is that this program was recorded and will be made available to watch free of charge on our YouTube channel. So everyone who registered here tonight will get a link to that recording and then you can watch it uh, on your own spare time and you can share it to whoever you would like. Um, we also wanted to mention that programs like this are free because of our membership base. Uh, so any members here in the audience today, thank you for your continued support. It is because of you that we're able to put on uh, programs of this caliber and invite uh, guest presenters like Madeline uh, and offer it for free. So thank you to everybody. Uh, the final note is that this is uh, the third program that we've done in the miniature theme and we have many, many more to come into 2023 all the way up until March. So this exhibit will be for sure available until the end of March of next year. And we'll have maybe two to three programs in January, February, and March to kind of complement the exhibit while it's open. So if you are a member, you'll already be receiving weekly newsletters that give you information uh, on those programs. And if you're not a member, we have a sign-up sheet in the back near the front desk where you can put in your name and your email, and every week you'll receive a free newsletter that tells you about upcoming programs, uh, volunteer
volunteering opportunities, ways to get involved, upcoming initiatives, and so forth. So that's a great way to keep in touch with everybody. Uh, and we also have a couple board members here tonight who would love the opportunity to get to speak to all of you and see what are some great ways to get involved here at the History Center. So with that, I just wanted to again mention that the exhibit is generously sponsored by Anne Lyon and the Hunter Family Foundation. And we'll split up into two groups now, so maybe 12 people first, and then the other 12 if you have any questions, or just want to take a look around the meeting.